You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast, and I have a great guest I've been looking forward to speaking with for a long time, James Shapiro. Um, he's uh, in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Chicago. Uh, he's an author and has published multiple, multiple papers, but a recent book that's come out uh, is Evolution of You from the 21st Century that he's put out. Uh, he's worked as a professor of microbiology at University of Chicago since 1973, which is longer than I've been alive. Um, he's done a lot of work in the uh, in, in various fields, and uh, really glad to talk to you today, James. How you doing? Well, I'm glad to talk to you too. I hope we have a good conversation. Yeah, well, I think we will. So, uh, well, there's so much you've covered; it's hard to uh, it's hard to know where to start. But um, conventional view, from what I've seen of evolution, for instance, is that you know it's driven by random genetic mutation and natural selection. But uh, you know, I'm sure you have tons to say about how it's not that. So maybe we can we can start there. You know, talk about just one of the elements or ways or experimentations you've seen that uh, maybe counter that. Right. Well, the the idea that just random mutations and natural selection account for evolutionary change was formulated in the 19th century and then early in the 20th century, and uh, it's kind of a great oversimplification. And actually, it's not accurate. Things don't happen that way. We know today that there are all kinds of active biological functions involved in real world, sometimes even real-time evolutionary change. And uh, living organisms, as, as we know them today, all have capacities to facilitate their own evolution when they are challenged, and they don't depend upon accident. Uh, they have built-in uh, systems for for evolving, which makes them evolve more efficiently. Is this, and, uh, you know, in bacteria, we've, we've seen microbial, I mean, um, antibiotic resistance, but what about in, you know, I guess you can call them higher forms of organisms. What about, you know, people or other animals? Can they well, change their, let's, let's, uh, their genetics quickly? Let, let's stick with, with antibiotic resistance for just a few minutes, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Because actually, one of the major evolution experiments we conducted was when we began to use antibiotics to treat infectious diseases after World War II. And when we did that, we had an idea of how bacteria could become resistant to the antibiotics by mutation. And uh, we applied the antibiotics, and sure enough, the bacteria became resistant. But when people studied the resistance, they found out it wasn't due to mutations. They picked up things like plasmids, which could transfer between bacteria. And these encoded all kinds of different mechanisms, which allowed the bacteria to fight off for the antibiotics. And so there was a completely novel and totally unexpected uh, set of things that happened that allowed the bacteria to rapidly evolve the antibiotic resistance they have and to spread it to new bacteria. And I think that's a, a, a useful example because it tells you how uh, you might think you know how something happens, and you might be able to confirm it in the laboratory, but actually in nature, something completely different can go on. And uh, hmm. now uh, we're worried about being able to use antibiotics because these resistance uh, elements have spread so widely that many of the most important uh, disease-causing bacteria uh, are antibiotic resistant. So what is so the I mechanism by which bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics, and what does that tell you about bacteria and cells in general? Well, there, there are two parts of that. One part is that they're able to acquire the biochemical 
mechanisms to become resistant. They can inactivate the antibiotics. They can pump them out of the cell. They can alter the cell so it's no longer sensitive to the antibiotics. Um, so uh, that's one part of the story. And the other part of the story is they have all of these means, which people didn't know about uh, back in the 1950s when we started with this experiment, whereby they can move these, the DNA encoding these various capacities from one cell to another, sometimes across very broad taxonomic boundaries, so that very different kinds of bacteria can become resistant and spread that resistance. So uh, the, the, the uh, ability to move DNA around, and also in ways that it's too technical to go into here, to uh, rearrange that DNA within the cell have been very important in, in uh, how they become resistant. And that's quite different from the kind of accidental mutations that people were talking about and that they often talk about when they refer to evolutionary change. Okay, so uh, what about, uh, oh, bacteria can do it, but uh, again, eukaryotic cells and, you know, and animals and people can't do it. What, what's your rebuttal to that or that thought? Well, that, that's kind of interesting, too. It's interesting. Do you know who Carl Woese was? Uh, a little. I've, I've heard the name, and uh, yeah, but you'd be able to speak about him better. Go ahead. He's been, he's been written up recently uh, in the New York Times and other places, and I, I, I think there have been some things on t television about him, too. Uh, it's only been 50 years, less than 50 years, that Carl Woese and his colleagues discovered that there's a, a form of life that we didn't know existed before 1977, which are called archaea. And they're, they're similar to bacteria in some ways, but they're very different in other ways. And bacteria and archaea are the oldest forms of life on the planet. And we don't know a lot about their early evolution because they're so old, um, but they're, they're over three and a half billion years old. However, there's, there's a third kind of uh, life on the planet, and we belong to that. And those are called eukaryotes, and those are cells with nuclei. And uh, we now have a pretty good idea of how those cells came about. And it's by a completely different mechanism. It's by cells merging together. And we know that about, say, one and a half to two billion years ago, a bacterial cell entered an, uh, an archaeal cell and became an endosymbiont and formed the, what, what we now call a mitochondrion in that cell and allowed it to carry out uh, aerobic metabolism. And interestingly, this was just when the atmosphere on planet Earth was beginning to accumulate uh, a good supply of oxygen. And so by this kind of cell fusion uh, and two cells joining together, you had a major step in evolution, actually the biggest step that we know about. So that's quite a different process and quite a much more active process than people normally talk about. Have scientists been able to create symbionts in the lab? you know, by having uh, bacteria merge with another type of cell, you know, under uh, pressures? Uh, well, we can, we can observe symbiosis occurring in the laboratory. Uh, think of root nodules on plants, which allow them to fix nitrogen. That's an example of endosymbiosis, where the bacteria actually enter into the cells uh, of the plants. And we mm -hmm. understand something about how the, the, the bacteria and the plants do that and it involves a lot of different functions that they have and a kind of chemical dialogue that goes on between the bacteria and the plants. So that's, that's an example of, of cell fusions that's occurring right now. And we know from genomics that a lot of cell fusions have gone on, and they've been important in evolution. So, for example, there are various kinds of organisms which eat plants. But plants are very difficult to digest. The, the polysaccharides that make up most of the plants are hard to digest, although bacteria and fungi have figured out how to do that. And it turns out that bacteria and fungi can become endosymbionts and help these organisms uh, become plant digesters. Or they can transfer the DNA that they have for enzymes which do that and give them to those other organisms. That's called horizontal DNA transfer. And they can acquire these new capabilities and then for extend the range of uh, 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 things that they grow on uh, by acquiring this new DNA. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So you said that bacteria will 
literally enter into uh, in between the cells of a plant and and help it to uh, to take root and to process nutrients. But do they actually fuse with the plant cells to make a new kind of cell, or do they stay separate? But they're just you know in the local environment and they're working with and communicating with the plant cells. No, no, I I actually meant that they they un, they 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 go inside the plant cells. That's called hmm. endosymbiosis, which means symbiosis within, uh, and not just living uh, within the you know adjacent to the plant cells. So there yeah, are lots and lots amazing. of examples of of that happening uh, throughout the course of evolution, and that's been important. All of the photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms, algae, plants. Uh, they all resulted from symbiotic events as well. And those are symbiotic events involving photosynthetic bacteria. Or later, uh, once there were photosynthetic algae formed, the algae could form, enter into other eukaryotic organisms and form symbi uh, photosynthetic eukaryotes as well. So there's a lot of cell merger going on all the time. And it's been extremely important in the evolution of all many, many different kinds of organisms, and certainly the organisms which produce the vast majority of the oxygen in the atmosphere, and we depend upon that, of course. But it seems like a lot of scientists would say, oh, this happened over millions of years, a long time ago, but, you know, do you believe, first of all, these kind of things happened within the span of one generation, or do they happen multiple times and failed and eventually took root and... and do they happen literally right now today? You know, a new species being created, for instance, today, or new symbionts that we're aware or not aware of? Uh, all of the above. In other <laughs> words, they happened. They've happened multiple times. The mitochondrion only appear, happened once, but photosynthetic uh, symbio symbiogenesis of uh, cell fusions, that's occurred many times. And there are multiple examples of that. And it's going on even, uh, even today. So plants that are not able to photosynthesize, they are emerging literally at this very moment with bacterial cells and becoming able to? Like literally new species are being created that have been observed, let's say, in the past few years? Um, I don't know about uh, plants, but there are some photosynthetic uh, single-celled organisms which lose and then pick up uh, new symbionts. Hmm. And we can, see, we can see evidence of those changes having occurred. So we know that there have been many, many events over a long period of time. And some of okay. the other symbiotic events that we, we know about, for example, uh, bacteria going into the cells of animals and forming endosymbiotic associations. We know that they're, they're going on over long periods of time because you have different endosymbionts in different groups of, of, of organisms. So the, the, the large organisms, the animals, are, are diverging. That takes some time, and then the endosymbionts enter into the new organisms as they're formed. Yeah, but what, why does it take some time? Like, like, for instance, you know, I have everyone on Earth has the microbiome inside of their body, and that changes depending on what you eat and you know, depending on environmental conditions and everything. But I don't know. Right, I, mean, those are... I don't know. I don't. I don't know. If bacteria actually merging with my somatic cells and changing them. I don't well, know. Actually. It's right. It turns out that vertebrates don't have endosymbionts, and that's a, a strange fact, which I don't think we really understand. But invertebrates, uh, insects, and, and similar uh, animals uh, do have endosymbionts. And there are a lot of people who, who talk about the fact that we have symbiotic organisms within us. Uh, uh, this is the, the microbiome, uh, that these uh, organisms contribute to the to the properties of of, of the of the larger organism, and that really what should be thought of in evolution is the whole thing, the combination of the large organism and its microbiome, and the term for that is called a holobiont. And of course, those associations can be very important in evolution. Hmm. So, so no one knows why vertebrates don't have endosymbionts. Uh, I'm I'm not aware of an explanation for it. It may be that somebody has an idea or a theory. Um, but when I was looking into this matter, that was the one exception that people pointed out. Plants have endosymbionts, uh, uh, invertebrates have endosymbionts, but not vertebrates. So what are what are some examples of invertebrates that have endosymbionts that are 
Uh, yeah, what are some examples that you've seen? Well, termites, uh, for example, uh, or uh, other insects that, that, that feed on plants, uh, and some of the endosymbionts, as I said, help them digest the plant material. Sometimes they help them make growth factors that they need to grow, and they they become essential. Yeah, do they become, I mean, how long does it take them to become integrated as a permanent symbiont versus uh, one that occurs, you know, once the organism is alive, but just happens because of its interaction with the environment? Well, I think uh, the, the entry into the cells uh, happens pretty quickly. And um, if, if it, it provides a, an adaptive benefit, then it becomes established. So why do, uh, why do scientists think that the merger of... Um, of what's what's now the mitochondrion and the uh, you know the prokaryotic cell to make animal cells happened only once and happened you know a long time ago however long that was why does it well, not happen now why is it you know why once uh, I don't think we necessarily understand that uh, the reason that it's not just animal cells it's all eukaryotic cells this is long before there were animals and plants uh, all eukaryotes have mi- mitochondria or uh, relatives of mitochondria. And we can tell from looking at part of their DNA sequence, because they have their own DNA, that they all came, they're all related to each other and came from a single origin. The photosynthetic uh, symbioses, on the other hand, where uh, cyanobacteria or algae have become endosymbionts, those have occurred many times, and we get uh, different endosymbionts forming the, what are called plastids, uh, similar to chloroplasts. And they carry out the photosynthesis in these organisms. So that's happened many times. Hmm. So what's the what's the consequence of that for vertebrates? I mean, you know, people, animals. You know, again, vertebrates are they at a? I don't know. Are they I guess to form endosymbionts, they're not going to do it, or they don't do it. It doesn't mean they're they're at a dead end, you know, in terms of evolution. But I don't know any insights on where they're going or where we're going, evolution wise. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's interesting to to to, to look at, at how 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 we've evolved. And let me take just a, a step backwards and, and say that in addition to uh, symbiosis and cell mergers, cells are filled with uh, biochemical activities that allow them to rearrange and restructure their DNA. They can cut and splice and change their DNA. Uh, I like to call it natural genetic engineering. And we know that that's been very important in the history of evolution. And uh, some of this natural genetic engineering involves pieces of DNA which move around in the genome and can accumulate in the genome. So if we look at the history of vertebrates, we can see a couple things. First of all, we can see that as the vertebrates and more complex organisms, and this is true of plants as well, have evolved, they've accumulated copies of this mobile DNA in their genomes. And this is, was, has been a great puzzle, and I'll come back to that later. But what we know is that these mobile DNA elements have actually been extremely useful in vertebrate evolution. And sometimes they coincide with virus elements. And the one kind of virus which has been very important in our own evolution are called uh, retroviruses. HIV is a retrovirus, but there are many different retroviruses. And when they infect a cell, they can insert into the genome, and then copies of the DNA which is inserted into the genome can spread around. And a number of very important adaptations that we have result from the spreading of these copies of these retroviruses, or what are called endogenous retroviruses. So, for example, pregnancy and viviparous reproduction in mammals depends upon uh, uh, retroviruses and other mobile DNA elements. So in making placenta, for example, is a very complex uh, developmental system for making the right proteins and expressing the right regions of the DNA. And it turns out that the transcription signals in the DNA are composed of these retroviruses. And uh, each group of mammals, and interestingly enough, seems to have its own retroviruses. Certainly mice, where it's been studied in most detail, uh, have retroviruses which are just unique to mice. And many of them are so unique to mice that they're not even found in rats. Well, well, quick quick question here. So are you saying that at some time in the past, viruses infected 
you know, these different creatures and they inserted their RNA into the cells, which got, which changed the, the structure of the creature's DNA. And now it's a permanent effect. Yes, except that it's not RNA which gets inserted. They take the RNA and, and they use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which converts the RNA to DNA. And they insert the DNA into the genome. And then the DNA proliferates and moves through the genome to many different places. And this has gone on repeatedly in evolution. And we can see many cases of it happening. And we can see it happening in real time in things like koalas nowadays are, are undergoing a retroviral invasion. Uh, and really? so, hmm. yeah. So you're saying, so this has happened with humans and that's what created the placenta? Or that's well, what it's created the placenta with, is this? It's happened. That it's happened in, in mammals in general, but interestingly, the placenta looks like maybe it gets rewired every time uh, uh, a new group of mammals uh, appear. This is something I've noticed that's a little bit of a mystery, and I, I, we don't understand it yet. Uh, also, when the placenta is formed, a retroviral protein called uh, 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 syncytin which means a cell fusion protein, is borrowed from the retroviruses. And every group of mammals has its own specific syncytin. So it looks like evolution is recapitulating itself time and again among the mammals uh, involving these retroviruses. And, and we don't really have a good idea of uh, what that means because the typical picture we have is that something evolves and then all the ancestors, all of the descendants, excuse me, use that invention from then on. Uh, but what we see happening in, in, in some of these cases in mammals is that the um, uh, evolution uh, of these uh, 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 systems needed for a pregnancy are happening over and over again. So they're, they're happening, some elements are not being passed down to the offspring, and then they have to happen again? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, we don't know whether they're not being passed down. What we know, like in the case of the mice, where it's very well documented, that the the the, the uh, uh, elements which make up these networks for making the placenta are specific to mice. So they're not using their ancestors' signals, their ancestors' DNA for doing this. They're using their own retroviruses, which are specific to them. And uh, I think it's a, a, an interesting question. Why is that happening over again? Is there something going on in that kind of evolution which we haven't thought about yet? And I suspect that that may be the case. What about um, epigenetics in uh, humans, for instance? Um, um, are epigenetic changes heritable? Um, do epigenetic changes cause changes in the underlying DNA? Uh, well, the whole meaning of epigenetic is that it's, it's around the genetic material. It's not in the DNA itself. It's about how right. the DNA gets packaged. However, <clears throat> these mobile DNA elements, including the, uh, the retroviruses, uh, help establish epigenetic patterns in the organism. And that plays a very important role in how the organism reads its DNA and forms uh, 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 different tissues on out of out of the same uh, DNA, so the different kinds of cells in, in our bodies and in other organ other multicellular organisms share the same genome, uh, but they have different characteristics, and that's partly due to epigenetic changes, which determine which regions of the genome are being expressed. All right, so I understand a little bit of epigenetics, but have you seen that again? Epigenetic changes then affect the underlying DNA itself and rearrange it or splice it or, you know, cause changes to it. Is that known? Well, these, these, these uh, mobile DNA elements that are, I've spoken about, and I want to come back to them a little bit more later, uh, they're under control. So they don't always act and move around and change the structure of the genome. And a lot of that control is epigenetic in, in nature so that they're silenced epigenetically. And that involves a, a complex system whereby the cell makes RNAs, uh, which are similar to these uh, sequences, and that instructs the cell 
to make certain kinds of histones, a certain form of uh, packaging the DNA so it's not expressed. But if that epigenetic control is disrupted by, for some reason, then those elements become active. And that can happen. Okay, I think I, I think I just realized something. I don't know if this is right. Let's say, and I know it's a real gross simplification, but let, let's say there's like a hundred, a sequence of a hundred base pairs. Um, mm -hmm. Are you saying that epigenetics will, you know, selectively cause uh, the things that read the base pairs to, let's say, skip over certain ones or start in one section and stop in another or start and stop in a different section, thereby getting different sure. information and, and, and encoding different proteins? Yeah, there's a whole elaborate code in the, in the DNA, which is involved in establishing what regions of the DNA are active and expressed and what regions are silent and not expressed. And that's the epigenetic control, and that can change. And that's a very but important if, part of it. If, if I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to understand this. If, if I thought of, like, if I thought of DNA as a record, on a record player, and I put mm -hmm. down the needle, that one, if I put the needle down at one part, it'll play the song, and if I pick up the needle and put it somewhere else, it'll just play a different part of that same song. But with DNA, if I pick up that needle, and I put it down in a different spot, will it, will it create a different protein? Will it act completely differently? Or will it, you know, quote-unquote, play that same song just at a different part of the song? I, I, I think a, a better analogy is a, a computer program uh, rather than a, a, a disk. In a okay. computer program, you can turn various regions on and you can turn them off. And that's what cells do with epigenetics. It's called epigenetic formatting. And it means to alter the way the DNA is read. And that changes as, as cells change. So can you have the same sequence of base pairs, and depending on how it's read, it can code for completely different things? There is some flexibility in how the DNA is, is read. But I'm talking mostly now about whether the DNA is read or not. With epigenetic regulation, what we're talking about mostly is whether or not a region is expressed, is transcribed. Uh, that's the, the major way it works. It, it affects other things as well, uh, which have to do with the replication of the DNA and the movement of chromosomes and so forth. There are ways that you can read different messages from the same stretch of DNA. And we know, for example, that some regions are broken up into different expressed parts called exons and then intervening parts called introns. And sometimes you can have different mixtures of the exons from a single region of DNA, and it will encode two structurally different proteins. So there's a lot of flexibility in there. That's amazing, because that means like DNA is, it has layers of codes. It's codes within codes. It's crazy. Well, exactly. And, and the point I want to make about evolution uh, that I haven't gotten to yet, but I, I think I need to make this point, is that the, the, the DNA is not fixed and can only change by accident. It can be remodeled and restructured by the cells. And in part, they use this re the, the, these mobile DNA elements, these repeat DNA elements to do that. And that allows them to create new networks in the program, new punctuation, and, and, and uh, even sometimes new code. Uh, which is, is uh, very important to how, how the genome functions or, or indeed what it, what it actually does. Well, what, is, what is being restructured? And then I, I guess it's funny to say who is, who is doing it. This, you're saying the cell itself, so it's, it's not just taking commands from the nucleus and the DNA only. It's, it's some other, other agency that's occurring somewhere else in the cell to cause this? The cells have all the enzymes they need to cut and splice their DNA and to change the structure. And it, it, cells do this in very characteristic ways. And uh, one of the things that they do is they move uh, pieces of DNA around. And we can see this happening in the course of evolution. And we can also see some of these DNA elements beginning to accumulate in evolution. And these mobile pieces of DNA are very important agents of allowing organisms to evolve because they can change the way the genome is expressed. They can change the epigenetic formatting. They can in, in, 
change what parts of the genome are transcribed into RNA and then express this protein. And what we noticed, what's been noticed is as organisms get to be more complicated, a lot of this DNA accumulates. And early on, this was the source of the idea of selfish DNA or junk DNA, which was just a complete misunderstanding of what this DNA was doing. Because actually, it's very important for evolution. It's important, as I said, for establishing these control networks for expression of the genome. Uh, it's important in the evolution of new protein coding sequences. And it turns out that if you look at the genomes of more and more complicated organisms, the DNA that increases in amount uh, in these more complicated organisms is the repeat DNA, the repetitive DNA, the so-called non-coding DNA. Whereas the, hmm. the DNA which codes for protein tends to level off. And Why that is that? Of but now we know about many of these repeat sequences in this non-coding DNA being involved in making regulatory RNA molecules. And this is a whole new area of, of uh, organization and control that we didn't know about uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And we now can understand why some of this what we thought was non-coding DNA is very important because it helps to make up this regulatory RNA, these regulatory RNA molecules, which are very important for the expression of very major characteristics of the organism. Hmm. So, so who, I guess, who's running the show? It's a, it's a weird question, you well, know? Well, I, I think it's a good question. I, I, I think it, it's clearly, it's the organisms themselves and the cells, uh, they, they, they do it, and they make all these changes, typically when they're under some kind of severe stress or when something unusual happens. For example, one of the things that activates this mobile DNA and also other kinds of DNA rearrangements is the hybridization and the fusion mating between two different species. And frequently, a new species comes out of this within a generation or two. And it doesn't always have just the, the mixture of characters of the two original species. Uh, it's what was called as long ago as 1951, cataclysmic evolution. So, for example, wheat appeared 10,000 years ago when two different grasses made it together and they produced wheat. And when these hybridizations occur, uh, the epigenetic regulations that there are keeping this mobile DNA and these DNA rearrangements quiet are disturbed, they become active, and we see chromosome changes and amplifications and movements of mobile DNA. And then we get a new species, which has a series of rearrangements in its genome. So it, I thought different species, by definition, couldn't have offspring. Well, that's one of those definitions, which is an idealized definition, but not a real definition. And in fact, I, 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 the more we look with genomics, the more we become, we begin to realize that most higher organisms are actually hybrids. So a very large so proportion of the organisms are hybrids. And that's an example, of course, of very rapid evolution that's triggered by an unusual mating. And those are more likely to occur when things get tough in the environment so that the mating populations are depleted. And it's hard to find a mate of your own species. So you go to somebody that's somewhat similar, but not your destined mate. And then all of a sudden, something changes, and uh, maybe you get a new kind of organism, which may be much more adapted to the new new conditions. So, do you think this is what happened with, I guess, Neanderthals and uh, I forget the other, you know, the other yeah, so, species of humans, yeah, to create our modern well, species? I think, yeah, I, I I don't know the answer to that question, and I don't know how different they were. It may be that we were all basically Homo sapiens. It wasn't like the kinds of interspecific changes I'm talking about. I, I just don't know not enough about it to, to give you a, a clear answer on that. But mm. um, at some point in, in the history of many mammals, there's clear evidence that hybridization has occurred. And uh, that's how, how many new species have emerged. And, of course, the DNA sequencing, right. as we get more and more of it, we get more and more information uh, about those processes. And I think the point is that cells have ways of changing their genomes, and they have ways of regulating this capacity to change their genomes. And various events in their life history can influence 
the activity of those capacities for changing the genome. And that's one of the ways that evolutionary change can be responsive to ecological change. So, I don't know, it's making me wonder uh, where, at what level does, I don't know, purpose and uh, consciousness arise? I mean, I know at the organism level, at least for, you know, let's say dogs and people and other creatures like that, but what about within, you know, the level of a cell or the level of a tissue? Well, I, 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 my career has, has been as a bacterial geneticist, and uh, I published a paper a number of years ago called Bacteria Are Small But Not Stupid. <laughs> And bacteria are exquisitely sensitive to what's happening outside of them and inside of their, their cells and adjusting to those changes. In her Nobel Prize address, Barbara McClintock, the person who discovered uh, mobile DNA the first time in the 19, late 1940s, uh, was studying how cells respond to chromosome breaks and was talking about the knowledge that the cells have of what's going on inside of themselves so that when there is a break, they can uh, adjust what they do and repair the break and restore the genome integrity. Uh, and uh, that kind of sensitivity, and uh, you might even call it uh, sentience, uh, is there in, in the cells. And it has to be there because cells have to adjust to, to circumstances as they change. So there's, there's a, a, a quite considerable capability for uh, sensing what's happening and adjusting to it that all organisms share. Now, where the boundaries are between this and what we like to think of as consciousness and so forth uh, is, a, is a, I think, quite a difficult problem. But there's lots of evidence for all kinds of uh, information processing uh, and sensing going on in the living world. And if you think about it for a minute, or you just observe any organism, even bacteria, you can see how, how uh, how much information they pick up, how aware they are of what's going on and what their surroundings are. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I, I think it points out that you're asking something which is relevant. And, yeah. and of course, there's the ability that cells have to, to make sense of the inputs that they get. Does this apply to how they change in evolution? I think that's a very important question, and we don't have an answer to that yet. Well, the fact that they do, that they respond to their environment, and like you said, they're exquisitively sensitive, means mm -hmm. that they have, uh, I guess, some sense of, of self, even if it's a, a lesser sense than maybe we have, but they have some sense. Absolutely. And they have some motivation, Absolutely. and they have some purpose. Yeah, yeah well, I think all cells uh, uh, are, are, are destined to, to survive, to repair damage, to reproduce. And that's just common to, to all forms of life. And to do that, they need to pick up information and make use of it. And the fact that they can do that sometimes to change their genomes and evolve into other organisms, I think is something that we have to come to terms with. Uh, the idea that you could explain evolution just by accidents and natural selection, as I said, was, is a gross oversimplification. And the process mm -hmm. is actually far more fascinating and far more interesting. Well, how about like an easy question? Uh, you know, how did life begin? <laughs> I don't have a clue. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of origin of life scenarios, and as, as somebody who's worked with living cells, none of them make sense. Well, what do you? I mean, what's your best guess? Because you worked with you know cells for so long and bacteria, and you have to have some thoughts. No, I, I, I've, I've actually felt most comfortable with saying it's really something that we just don't understand because you have you to think we'll ever understand. ever understand it oh i wouldn't necessarily say that because you know the way science is all the things i was telling you about about how cells change their genomes and how viruses can come in into the genome and multiply within the genome and change the way the genome acts and so forth there was a time when we didn't know any of that so we're hmm. always learning things and uh, it may be that, that uh, we will learn uh, how, how ultimately have a, a plausible explanation for how life began. But I think that yeah. right now we're, we're missing some very basic things that are needed to, to make sense of that. So, for example, a lot of people look at RNA molecules and study RNA molecules that can duplicate themselves. 
But in order for yeah. RNA molecules to duplicate themselves, you have to have high energy precursors for the RNA. And somebody has to provide those. Well, in the experiments, it's the experimenter. But at the origin of life, where did they come from? And where did the metabolism come from? Where did the ability to code proteins in DNA and, and, and RNA come from? These are very complicated and difficult problems to answer. And I think we're, we're really, um, we're really uh, not in a position to give any kind of sensible answer to those questions. Because, as I said, you have to do so many things. I think it's easier to talk about evolution. Okay. Because with evolution, we've got, we have a, an empirical record. And we have fossil records. We have the, the organisms themselves. We have their genomes. We can compare genomes. We can ask, by comparing genomes, we can ask how long did a certain kind of structure in the genome persist and so forth and so on. And that's most of the way that we've reconstructed our picture, our contemporary picture of evolution. This was something that wasn't available to the pioneers in evolutionary theory. So they could talk about things like accidental mutations and natural selection. They didn't know about endosymbiosis. Mitochondria, chloroplasts, and plasmids are descendants of bacteria. They didn't know about hybrid speciation. They didn't know about repetitive mobile DNA elements. We now know about all of these things, and we can track their, their uh, activity and behavior in the course of evolution. And that's very exciting. So we, we have real evidence about that. When we come to what happened to give us the first cells, there we're stuck. We don't have any empirical evidence of, of what preceded them. Is it surprising to you that there are, there don't seem to be uh, intermediate forms of creatures in the uh, in the fossil record? Or does that make total sense? Well, the fossil record is rather difficult for microorganisms for the earliest ones. Mm. And we have some evidence for that, but not detailed evidence of what the organisms were like. Are people ultimately going to be able to turn up ancient forms of DNA and fossils and things like that? Perhaps, and that might be a help. But I, I think by the time you've got DNA, you've pretty much got a living cell. And uh, how you got there is still an open question. Well, I mean, I, I guess, you know, it's probably a very personal question. I don't know if you mind, but uh, do you believe that there was a creator or there had to be one, or do you believe a life, life evolved out of nothing, nothingness? Uh, well, uh, life evolved out of matter, and um, so it didn't evolve out of nothingness. And the whole point of science is to say you can't bring in a deus ex machina. You can't make up something to solve your problem for you. Hmm. So that's not science. Whatever your personal beliefs are, uh, when you're a scientist, you have to say, how can I follow the empirical evidence, and what do I know? So we can see viruses doing certain things. We can see DNA changing in certain ways. We can follow it in the laboratory. We can see the evidence of it in the databases, and we can, we, we can know what happened there. Now, the question that came up that you raised, and I think it's a good one, is what makes it come out right? How do complex things like new kinds of uh, body forms and so forth, how do, they, how do they appear in the course of evolution? Uh, I don't think we understand that yet. And I think that's partly because it hasn't, people haven't been allowed to ask that question properly before and because we haven't yet thought up the kinds of experiments we need to do to get answers to that. So, for example, I've just written a paper and I want to, Ask the question, uh, can multiple mutations or multiple changes of different places in the genome be linked together, or must they occur independently of each other? And conventional wisdom is that they have to be independent of each other. But you can actually do rigorous quantitative experiments to ask that question. And I'm hoping that somebody will, will do them. And well, get... I, I think that goes to the underlying assumption. If you think things are random, then sure, yeah, they wouldn't be linked. But they certainly don't appear to be, and they appear to be because of environmental pressures. So it makes sense, of course, they would be linked because, you know, uh, to respond to an environmental pressure, maybe one change won't do it. So you'd have to do a cascade of them where you'd, you'd hone in on, you know, you'd prune and hone in and course correct to uh, 
to adapt to the stress in the right way that, that benefits you. Right. Well, I think we now know the bits and pieces that are used, at least some of them, and we can begin to do more sophisticated experiments looking at control over how these systems operate. And we know uh, various kinds of sequence evidence that these various mobile DNAs and other things that I've told you about don't operate in in a random way. They operate in rather specific ways. And so they must be under some form. They are, we know they are under control and and regulation. And how that regulation works to, to make them produce useful adaptation, I think, is a really interesting question. But it's a question which uh, it's been very difficult to answer because the idea of evolution as just being random processes has been so dominant for so long and it's become such a, a dogma that it's been very hard for people to say, well, no, that's not what the evidence tells us. You know, why do you think it's become like a religion, essentially? Like a, Why has it become such a... I don't know, like a totalitarian dogma. That when I've seen scientists that say, "Well, I don't think that's the way things are," I mean, they're called idiots, and they're it's it's weird. I don't know why there's like such a fervor for people to uh, to keep those beliefs in the face of contrary evidence. It's strange. I, I think it has to do more with human nature and how human beings form groups and reinforce themselves in groups and exclude other people from groups. Um, than it has to do with, it has, it's not science. The science is, is, is being open to new ideas and to new ways of looking at things and to new kinds of evidence. Yeah. You don't make real progress in science if you don't do that. True. That was true. So what what other, um, I, I mean, uh, you know, I know we're running out of time. You've been on for a while and I appreciate it. Are there one or two other topics that you wanted to talk about, maybe perhaps in cell signaling or, you know, other uh, other areas that we haven't covered? Let me, let me just take a look at my list. Hold on. Sure. Well, I think I've covered the, the selfish DNA, junk DNA idea mm. adequately. Do you, do you agree? Yeah, well, I guess it's, I, I don't know, like, well, DNA, is, I guess what's important to that idea is that uh, if you think DNA is selfish, well, that must mean it can act alone, but it doesn't seem like it can act alone, and it seems more of a... Um, a passive tool that the cell uses and can change and modify instead of the, uh, you know, top-down control from the DNA itself. It seems like that's the model a lot of people have, but it's it's not. It seems like the cell itself is uh, is using the DNA as like a, a again like a tool that it can yeah. modify and change and all that. Exactly, it's a database. Hmm. It's a database and it uses it to store information about proteins, RNAs and various routines that it has, and so forth. Uh, and DNA itself is one of the most passive molecules uh, in a cell. It does participate directly, chemically, in certain reactions, but very few. Mostly it's active upon by enzymes and, and, and uh, other molecules. RNA is more active because it can have enzymatic activity, and it can target things to different places in the genome, as we see in CRISPRs. Um, but the, the idea of selfish DNA was that there was this abundant DNA in genomes and nobody knew what it did, so they decided to call it junk DNA. Yeah. And I, I think that relates to the, the thing you were asking about why is it that, that people are, are so negative about different ways of thinking about a, a subject such as evolution. And I think this was another example of that. People didn't know what this DNA did, so they said they call it junk DNA. And it turns out when we look at it, 40 or 50 years later, you know, it does all kinds of things in terms of restructuring genomes and uh, coding for regulatory functions and so on, and we begin to appreciate the role that it plays, and these are roles that we didn't even know existed uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Hmm. So it, it's always it's always good to, to realize that the, the, the ideas and the, and the knowledge that we have now is not the same as the ideas and the knowledge we're going to have in the future. Mm. We're going to know about things which we haven't even thought of yet. That's why I say maybe somebody will come up with some good ideas for the origin of life, but right now I think we need to recognize that we don't have terribly good ideas. Well, with our current understanding of you know, medicine, science, genomics, etc., do you think it's likely in the near future that we'll be able to... Uh, 
you know, do things like uh, change organisms and have the characteristics we want, you know, have designer babies, um, you know, eliminate disease. I mean, all these great promises that, uh, that seem to be out there. Or do you think it's far more complicated than we can imagine? Well, eliminating disease, I think, is, is, is far more complicated than we can imagine. We may be able to do certain things. I mean, this, this Chinese guy who, who just engineered these twins in China, did it to make them so they wouldn't be infected by HIV since their father was HIV positive. So we understand how to do certain things like that. But those are, are relatively minor modification. And we may be able to, to modify organisms in, in ways that are quite useful. Uh, but I think we'll need to understand better uh, how new characteristics evolve and uh, come about in the course of evolution. I mean, totally new characteristics like uh, uh, the viviparous reproduction and pregnancy um, and how that happens. And before we're going to be able to make major changes like that in the organisms we know about. Once we understand things like that, we may be able to make those changes. I'm, I'm not very much in favor myself of human experimentation. I think it could end up be a little bit like Facebook. Okay. It sounds like a great idea. <laughs> it turns out to be a disaster. <laughs> well, uh, left to their own devices, you know, without human intervention, any indication on where evolution is going, where it's taking everyone and everything? Uh, no, but we're about to find out because climate change is really changing the ecology in some pretty radical ways. Hmm. And we'll, we'll see a lot of organisms go extinct, and that happens uh, periodically in, in the history of, of, of life and the history of the planet. Uh, but I'm sure new organisms will be formed. Uh, and uh, so we'll have a chance to observe that, those of us who, who managed to survive. Okay. Well, on that happy note, I, uh, I appreciate you coming and, and talking. And, you know, it sounds like there's tons of resources people need to look into to learn more about, you know, all of what we talked about. What, what are some good places to start? What would you recommend for listeners? Uh, I gave you a couple links. Uh, okay. I'll get those posted with the show notes. Anything else? I try to put as, me, me, as many of the references uh, for a lot of these ideas and, and phenomena as I can online at my website. So um, they can look up my book. They can look up my website. Uh, we have this group of people who have different ideas about evolution called the Third Way of Evolution. Uh, I believe I gave you that link as well. Mm -hmm. and, and Dennis is, is no, Dennis Noble is part of that. Right, right. Okay. So, so we have uh, thirdwayofevolution.com, right. and then some directories from here, and then uh, personal website. The URL again is uh, what is that? Shapiro.bsd.uchicago.edu. Yes, exactly. And okay. Also, and then my book, Evolution of You from the 21st Century. And also, I, I had I blogged on the Huffington Post for a while. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.